Psalms chapter 71 is a psalm of the old age. It's a psalm to those who have, uh, if you have gray hair, you'll be blessed. This one's just for you. If, you. if you're old, you'll be blessed. This one's just for you. So we said, well, what's old? I don't know. <laughs> but, but we know that uh, if, if this very well could be King David uh, that wrote this, although we're not really told that in the heading it doesn't uh, have any subscription. Um, um, some of them will say a Psalm of David or a Psalm of Asaph. Um, but this particular one is just, he's an old guy. And it very well could be uh, King David in his old age that wrote this. But either way, um, we note, uh, In thee, O Lord, Psalm 71, verse 1, In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be put to confusion. And one thing, of, and we're going to learn from the verses that we'll get to eventually, that um, this is an old man that's writing it. It's an old psalmist. Again, could be David. But when you get older, the danger of being confused and being in confusion, um, things setting in, uh, forgetting your password, I heard a, a really good one that um, somebody, you know, getting getting older in age, always forgetting their password. They just finally made their password incorrect. That's way that way. Every time they put it in, it was wrong. They'd be reminded what their password was. <laughs> Your password is incorrect. It's, oh right, my password is incorrect. But we get we get confused as older age, who's the one that can keep you from being confused? It's not a physician. It's not some uh, medication. It's not some uh, wholesome food. <laughs> Whatever you may be thinking, in thee, O Lord, if you're like David, if this is David or the psalmist that's writing this, if you're like them and trusting in the Lord. <laughs> Verse 1, in thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. There's a whole sermon just in verse 1. Why? Psalm 71. Why, why is it so important that we put our trust in Him? It's so that, it's so that we understand there's so many other things we have a tendency to put our trust in. We have a tendency to put our trust in other people. We have a tendency to put our trust in other things, in bank accounts, in uh, <laughs> articles, whatever they may be. We do. We have a tendency to put our trust in other things. So David knew, or the writer of this psalm knows, in thee I put my trust. Let me never be put to confusion. Or, or even be, when you are confused, you, you're shamed. You are ashamed that that you're you don't understand what's going on, <coughs> and it's the Lord that can keep you from that. So deliver me. Verse two goes on. You all at seven Psalm seventy one now. Indeed. Everything's cleared up there. So, <laughs> verse two. Deliver me in thy righteousness, and cause me to escape. Incline thine ear unto me and save me. Be thou my strong habitation, whereunto I may continually resort. Thou hast given commandment to save me, for thou art my rock and my fortress. Deliver me, O my God, out of the hand of the wicked, out of the hand of the unrighteous and the cruel man. For thou art my hope, O Lord, thou art my trust from my youth. By thee have I been upholden from my mother's womb. 
Thou art he that took me out of my mother's bowels. My praise shall be continually of thee. And I am as a wonder unto many, but thou art my strong refuge. So let my mouth be filled with thy praise and with thy honor all the day. Cast me not off in the time of old age. Forsake me not when my strength faileth. For mine enemies speak against me, and they that wait for my soul take counsel together, saying, God has forsaken him, persecute and take him, for there is none to deliver him. O God, be not far from me, O my God. Make haste for my help. Let them be confounded and consumed that are adversaries to my soul. Let them be covered with reproach and dishonor, them that seek my hurt. But I will hope continually and will yet praise thee more and more. My mouth shall show forth thy righteousness and thy salvation all the day, for I know not the numbers thereof. I will go in, thy, in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of thy righteousness, even of thine only. Hmm. So, just in these first, you know, 16 verses that we read, there's a lot in here that we can take away, but one thing we want to, and we touch from verse 1 again, your trust. Where are you putting your trust? And again, there's so many that, are, that we tend to put our trust in. And it, our flesh has the tendency to, to believe and to put our trust and rely on things that are unreliable, that, that have no uh, value whatsoever. Uh, when we truly are trusting in Him... This guy who wrote this is old enough to, to understand it's worth it. When you're putting your trust in him and not in some human, not in some philosophy, not in some other thing, when you really are putting your trust and everything in the Lord, it's worth it. This old guy is saying, the old psalmist, the writer here, cast me not off in the time of my old age. We know um, the writer, whoever he is. And actually, uh, when we get down to verse uh, 18 also, the gray-headed, you know, a couple more verses down. But I'm old, but I can look back on my life and see how the Lord has been faithful. That's what this psalmist could say. I've been there. I'm an old, old man, the psalmist would say. And I can look back on my life. And if it's David, the time of being a shepherd out in the field, <coughs> and seeing how God had used me and protected me even out there in the field to give me strength, to help me to go on when I wanted to give up. David was a young man who walked with the Lord, who knew the Lord, had a love for the Lord. <clears throat> if Again, if the writer is David, we can assume that it was. But he, in his old age now, is looking back on his life and seeing how the Lord was there. The Lord was there with me when no one else was. See, David is an interesting guy in the Bible. Not that many are like him that we even know. Because David had the closest and most faithful friends who would not leave him for anything or anyone, and yet he had enemies that were just as faithful to the enemy. Just as loyal to the opposition. David had enemies that were sworn, that vowed to kill him. To, to hunt him down and to kill him. One of those enemies was his own son, Absalom. So David had friends that were very close, 
but then he had enemies that were after him nonstop. See, we might have close friends, but any enemies that we have, we, we may not know about them. They're not seeking after our lives, hunting us down. So David, being on the run many times, drew closer to the Lord. God uses opposition. God uses these times of, uh, well, fear for David in his own life. He uses that, those times to draw him closer and that David could look back now as an old man. Again, if, if he's the one writing this. Um, and see how God never failed me once. I could have died here. I could have died there. And God never failed me once. Verse uh, 17, we left off. Uh, Psalm 71, 17. Oh God, you're the one that have taught me from my youth. And hitherto have I declared thy wondrous works. Now also when I am an old man, an old and gray-headed, O oh God, forsake me not until I have showed thy strength unto this generation. This is great for any old teacher to be listening to and hearing this. Let me be one that shows it to this generation, David said. He had a heart for the young men, the young women, those next generation that would be coming up. What would I declare to this generation? Thy strength unto this generation, and thy power, the end of verse 18, to everyone that is to come. I want to declare his strength, his power. And it goes on, verse 19. Thy righteousness also, O God, is very high. <laughs> Who has done great things, O God? Who is like unto thee? Thou which has sh showed me great and sore troubles. You've seen me through. You've showed me these things. You've quickened me again. And shalt bring me up again from the depths of the earth. Thou shalt increase my greatness and comfort me on every side. And I will also praise thee with the psaltery, even thy truth. O God, unto thee will I sing with the harp. O thou holy one of Israel, my lips shall greatly rejoice when I sing unto thee, and my soul which thou hast redeemed. My tongue also shall talk of thy righteousness all the day long, for they are confounded, for they are brought unto shame that seek my hurt. Psalm 71, right? Just an incredible... Uh, call to leadership, I think. Someone who's truly looking to be honorable, to be looked up to. Someone in their old age that, you know, you could become one of two things as you get older. You could become better or you can become bitter. It's really true. And you become more of what you have always been. <laughs> if you are a little impatient with folks, you're going to become even more impatient with folks as you get older. And it's become even more evident over the years. That guy that's yelling at the kids that are passing by on the front lawn, and he's, <laughs> he didn't just become that way overnight. It's built up, you know. Get off my lawn! <laughs> that guy doesn't just become like that overnight. That's a process that happens. And so too, we don't become patient, gentle, loving. What's the fruit of the Spirit? Galatians chapter 5. Self-control. That's the big one. <laughs> Love, patience, kindness, goodness. All of these things. Joy in the Holy Spirit. Peaceable. Someone who's... It's hard to get you angry. That's probably the, the best 
description I could come up with. You know, being one who's full of compassion, full of uh, the joy of the Lord. You know, if you've been around these folks, there's quite a few of them around here at this church that are gray-headed, that are old, experienced, but full of the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Holy Spirit. They're not bitter. They're not holding grudges. They're not uh, caught up in the things of the past. I don't know how many times, <laughs> you know, the temptation's always there for us to be looking back instead of looking forward. Paul the Apostle wrote in Philippians chapter 3, I'm forgetting what verse, but you all know the verse. <laughs> yeah. Don't look back. Yeah. Press on. Forgetting those things which are behind me, I press on. He wrote that after 32 years in the ministry. Many people hear that verse and they think, yeah, well, Paul, oh, yeah, sure. Right when he became Paul, you know, his big conversion. No, this was after 32 years of planting churches, being imprisoned. He would write, forgetting all that stuff, putting that behind me, I press on. Verse 12? Yeah. So Philippians 3.12. There you go. So Paul would be one who would age well because he didn't hold on to these things in the past and say, if only it was like it was in 1938. I don't think he's around then. <laughs> if only it was like it was in, in this year in this time we can we it's a temptation for us to think of the the glory days or the the golden age whatever it might be we forget those things and we look forward to see what the lord is doing now and he understood verse 6 you have holden me up from the womb lord you know me better than anyone else better than my own mom Better than everyone else. The Lord is incredible. His care, His passion, His compassion, His kindness towards those who will hear Him. Now, why did this old guy know that it, if God has been faithful, that He will be faithful? Why did He know that? Well, uh, couple scriptures, Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. Malachi is the last chapter, the last, last book in the uh, Old Testament. Malachi 3, verse 6 says, I am the Lord, I change not. Malachi 3, 6. This is why it's such an encouragement when we go through the Word, when we go through the Bible, we understand God has done this in the past. We know He will be faithful. Because He was faithful to Joseph in Genesis, as we're looking on Sunday mornings. He was faithful to David throughout the Psalms, from 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings. He was faithful to all the prophets. And He was faithful to uh, Paul the Apostle. He's faithful. He changes not. And do you know this? Don't let it be a secret. He's the only one that doesn't change. Everything else, including you, including me, we change. We change our minds about this or about that. We change from day to day. Our feelings change. Philosophies of the world change. It's shifting. In fact, Peter, remember what Peter's name was? Simon. What does Simon mean? Shifting sand. But Peter means rock. It's a little pebble, but it's still a rock. <laughs> Petros, you know, the little pebble, but it's still a rock. 
That's what God did in Peter. He changed him from shifting sand to a rock. And like David said, you are the rock. <laughs> and Peter understood who the rock was. Walked with Jesus, the rock. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Verse 3, looking back at Psalm 71, verse 3. We don't, we're dissecting this now. We're looking back at some of these verses we just read and understand what David said. You are my rock and my fortress. You understand that? A hospital room is not your fortress. It's not your rock. It could fail. It could actually be more dangerous to be in there than to be here, than to be in the hands of the almighty great physician. If you trust in him and you're not trusting in science or in uh, medical training. <clears throat> See, we, we have the tendency, don't we, because of human nature, because of, of all of the uh, accomplishments of man, we start to put our trust in other things. He's a rock. He's never going to change. Malachi 3.6 I am the Lord. I change not. He says very clearly. We read through that stuff. In fact, the one that blesses me the most, I have to go back to over and over. 2 Timothy 2.13. I've committed this one to memory. <laughs> if we believe not, 2 Timothy 2.13. If we believe not, if I say, you know what? I don't believe in Jesus. I don't believe in God no more. If I come to that point, He abides still. 2 Timothy 2.13. He abides faithful for he cannot deny himself. That's in her purse, I think. No, I think it's her, her purse over here. She's asleep, so anyways. <laughs> okay. Wait, that's not 2.13. Second Timothy. 2 Timothy 2.13. 2 Timothy 2.13 says, If we are faithful, as he remains faithful. Yeah, if we, if he, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. You got a watered down translation, got to get an updated one for you. Mine is the updated If we believe not, if we don't believe in God, that's faithless. If I'm faithless, if I believe not, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. It doesn't matter if I believe he exists or not. The question is, are you going to come to that point where you not only believe he exists, but you trust and you believe and you put everything in him? That's trusting in him. That's faith. My faith isn't just put in the chair that I'm sitting in, or the car that I turned a key and it started up. We all have a measure of faith, Paul would write, but what are you putting your faith in? And what good does it do to put your faith in a chair? It's just going to hold you up for a time. You put your faith in the living, all-knowing, all-powerful God of the universe? Guess what that means? If you really put your faith in Him, that means trusting Him above all others, forsaking all others, and trusting in Him alone. It means eternal life. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. It's eternal life that we're talking about. It's not just some temporary thing. It's not just some fantasy. It's an eternal commitment, eternal life. And that's why it's under such attack. The cross of Christ reminds us every day of how narrow the way really is. How few there are that find it. There's a broad, broad way where it's easy. Many there are that go that way. The few are those that find <laughs> life and they are uh, not just finding life, but finding fulfillment in the cross of Jesus Christ. That is Calvary. 
Something else I note from Psalm chapter 71 before we go on is uh, not only the Lord is faithful, even when I'm faithless, He remains faithful. That He doesn't change. He's going to be faithful because He's always been faithful. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Hebrews 13, 8, right? <laughs> Jesus Christ is the same that He was yesterday, today, and forevermore. But note these two, well, there's quite a few phrases for it, but my praise, the end of verse 6, Psalm 71, 6, my praise shall be continually of thee. My praise. And then verse 8. Let my mouth be filled with thy praise. And I made a note in my Bible. And not idle gossip or chatter. <laughs> idle conversation. Talking about things that are empty. With your honor. And then, if you haven't been convicted yet, the end of verse 8 should convict you. With thy honor, how long? All the day long. Yeah, we might come to church for an hour, maybe two, if you're real spiritual. And you might honor the Lord. You might start to praise the Lord and speak, speak uh, words of, of exaltation to the Lord. And that's just for that little window of time. How about all the day? I'm guilty there. That cuts me deep. Because we all get on the freeway. We all get back home. Where the enemy's waiting, right? <laughs> get you back in your flesh. Start talking about this, talking about that. No. Honor the Lord all the day long. And you jump down to verse 15 again. My mouth will show forth thy righteousness. And the end, uh, verse 16, actually it's the middle of verse 16, I will make mention of thy righteousness. What's it talking about? My mouth. And then the very uh, last two verses there, verse 23 and verse 24, My lips shall greatly rejoice. My tongue also shall talk of thy righteousness. What are we talking about? What do we spend our time talking about? Right. And again, this gets me every time. Is it of His righteousness? And here's one to jot down. Here's one to write down. I did <laughs> just a little nice saying. It's not a scripture, but something to remember. The older I get, the older I get, there should be less and less talk about me. Mm -hmm. The older I get, there should be less and less about me. Who am I praising? Who am I lifting up? Who am I talking about? Jesus. Amen. Christ. Exalt Him. Praise His name. It's His righteousness. It's His glory. That's what we're all going after. What I experienced in 1994... At the Harvest Crusade, when I did that, and I did this, and I, I, this, this. Watch out for that junk. You'll hear pastors do it constantly. I, be, I are one. I am one that talks that way, and I can find myself talking about my experiences, or my this or that. The older I get, I hope that my talk is less and less about me and more and more praise and worship all the day long. My lips shall praise thee, we sang earlier. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I'm not singing of, of my stuff. That, the last song we did before the study tonight. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. My lips shall praise thee. You know, my tongue shall talk of thy righteousness all the day long. We can find ourselves talking about nothing but ourselves and our experiences and those things that we've experienced and gone through. The older you get, watch out for that temptation to just 
It's all about him, I guess. It's all about me, 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 and what I've gone through. And, I, well, this, you know. No, let it be about the Lord constantly, always lifting up his name, praising his name. And as I get older, I hope, and I can, you get this from the writer, David, probably, that as you get older, the more I need him. The more I, I understand, it's me. I need you, Lord. I'm lost without you. I'd be a dead man without you. And it's his power that we proclaim to every generation, to the ones, everyone that is to come. Those that seek after my life, God takes care of them. J David would write, you know, um, I also like, I will, uh, verse 22, verse 22, I will also praise thee with the psaltery, that's an instrument back in thy, but it, it follows up, even thy truth. That reminds me of praise songs, worship songs that speak of his truth. And they're not just talking about feel good this and feel good that and making, you know, a love song into a Christian song. Stand by your man. Whatever it might be. Whatever song you might change to the, to the words. No, praise Him even thy truth. That's what we're singing about. That's what we want to play songs about. Well, how do you know it's His truth? Well, that's when it's awesome when it's the Word of God. When what we're singing comes directly out of the Word of God, you can't go wrong. You can't go wrong when it's the Word of God. If it's Chris Tomlin, you might go wrong. Now, we like him, right? Step on a few toes there. If it's this, if it's this writer or this guy or that, hey, I could go wrong. But if it's the Word of God that we're singing, you can't go wrong. <laughs> and no, it, it's praising His truth. There's not getting over it. You know, those Dave Hunt used to call many Christian churches, many well-meaning churches that do these songs. And he, Dave, <laughs> Dave Hunt, a uh, great theologian and scholar that I always love to hear from, Dave Hunt, used to call them 7-Eleven songs. Seven words sung 11 times over and over and over and over. <laughs> these songs that we'll go to church and we'll hear. People singing these seven words over and over 11 times. And many times people don't know what they're singing. They're just kind of mouthing the words. David was a man who not only understood, but he's praising God for his truth. That God is almighty. God is powerful. He's faithful. He's seen me through. You've been faithful, Lord. When we're young, maybe you're here tonight, you're young. You can think it will get easier as you get older. Don't think that. Because the truth of the matter is, it only gets harder as you get older. The temptations only get stronger. And the risk only gets greater. It's not just you you're responsible for no more. It's not just your family that you're responsible for as you get older, as the Lord starts to elevate and use you more. For Joseph, it was the whole Egyptian you know, government on his shoulders. For Jesus Christ, it was the whole world. You think you've got stress, getting stressed out at work, or big thing on your plate to take. Jesus had the world. Sins of the world were paid for by the blood and the, the uh, well, price was paid. Amen? Amen? So the kingdom, the king, the righteous king, that's the title of our 
message tonight comes from Psalm 72. You thought we'd never make it. No, I knew it was Some of you say, oh great, here he goes. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Give the king thy judgments, O God, and thy righteousness unto the king's son. First thing that you should note is this is possibly written for Solomon. It also could have been written by Solomon. Solomon penned many of the Proverbs. Um, get familiar with the book of Proverbs if you aren't. It's, it's just awesome to see the Lord's wisdom. But whether it's written for Solomon or by Solomon, we, we see this psalm giving a son uh, wisdom and really a prayer for him. So give the king thy judgments, O God, and thy righteousness unto the king's son. He shall judge thy people with righteousness, and thy poor with judgment. Righteous judgment. <laughs> the mountains shall bring peace uh, to the people, and the little hills by, re by righteousness. He shall judge the poor of the people. He shall save the children of the needy, and shall break in pieces the oppressor. They shall fear thee as long as the sun and the moon endure. Throughout all generations, he shall come down like rain upon the moan, grass, upon the grass, and as showers that water the earth. In his days shall the righteous flourish, and abundance of peace so long as the moon endures. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea, and from the river unto the ends of the earth. They that dwell in the wilderness shall bow before him, and his enemies shall lick the dust. The kings of Tarshish and the isles of shall bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba shall offer gifts. Yea, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. For he shall deliver the needy when he crieth. The poor also, and him that has no helper. He shall spare the poor and the needy, and shall save the souls of the needy. He shall redeem their soul from deceit and violence, and precious shall their blood be in his sight. And he shall give, or live, and to him shall be given of the gold of Sheba. Prayers. Uh, prayer also shall be made for him continually, and daily shall he be praised. There shall be an handful of corn in the earth upon the top of the mountains. The fruit thereof shall, shall shake like Lebanon, and they of the city shall flourish like grass of the earth. His name shall endure forever. His name shall be continued as long as the sun and men uh, as long as the sun and men shall be blessed in him. All nations shall call him blessed. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only doeth wondrous things. And he blessed, or sorry, and blessed be his glorious name forever. And let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. The prayers of David the son of Jesse, are ended. So, book two of the book of Psalms comes to a conclusion. Um, so, and next week, Lord willing, we'll begin book three that goes all the way from 73 through 89 of kind of the way that the book of Psalms could be divided up. But, Obviously, there is much meaning to Psalm 72. Um, prophetic meaning. The king that this is referring to in Psalm 72 has come once, but they didn't receive him as king. In fact, they rejected him as their king. And he died. For them. But the second coming is, is at hand. And this king, the righteous king that Psalm 72 is prophesying about, 
Again, this is probably David, the same guy that wrote Psalm 22. The same guy that wrote earlier in Psalm 22. They pierced my hands and my feet in great detail prophesying about Jesus Christ being crucified. This is the same writer, I think, David, writing about how all kings of the earth shall come and bow down before him. How his name shall endure, how long? Forever. Not Solomon. Not David. And in Proverbs it says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. The very name of the Lord. We know what that name is. Is it no wonder? Jesus. 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 Like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus. 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 There's just something about that name. It really is. The name of the Lord shall endure forever. This king that it's speaking of shall be um, exalted and his kingdom, his dominion also will go from sea to sea, from the river unto the ends of the earth. The idea is the whole earth will be filled with his glory. That Christmas song, Joy to the World, it's about the second coming of Christ. It's about this, the, the kingdom age. How there will be a time that many don't believe in, that many never really think about. Um, they'd rather be depressed, I guess. People don't think about this time when the, the wolf will lay down next to the lamb, be totally unharmed. The little children will play with poisonous snakes, and those snakes won't bite them. The scriptures tell us about this time. When at a hundred years old, that person will die at a hundred years old, and it will be considered sudden infant death. Like we think of a baby that dies. The Bible talks about this time, the kingdom age. We can't even imagine what it's going to be like, but we'll be there. It's going to be amazing. And the older you get, the more you start hoping. The more you start praying and understanding verses like verse 5. Now this is going back one chapter. 71 verse 5. David said, Thou art what? My hope. And then you can jot next to Psalm 71 verse 5. Titus 2.13. And I love this. Titus 2.13 is one that reminds us, hey, Titus 2.13, that my uh, hope, we look for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ who gave himself for us. Titus 2.13 and 14. But Titus 2.13 speaks of this blessed hope. We have a hope that's not like the world. We have a peace that's not like the world gives. It doesn't just, you know, last for this little bit of time, however long the drug might last. It doesn't, we're not just hoping the way the world hopes that this president will do this and this army will do that and this will happen to... No, we're not hoping in that way. This hope is a blessed hope. And we're looking for our appearing, for His appearing where He will meet us in the air. It's the righteous King. He's coming. People have been saying it for years and years and years. But I really believe... That it's coming. And if you're watching and you're waiting and you're always persistent in that hope, you will not be failed.
His kingdom come. His will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Not the other way around. We don't say that heaven will become like the earth and one day all of heaven will just come down to this earth. No. Or that we somehow need to make heaven happen here on this earth. No. That's, that's false. <laughs> it's, it's His kingdom come, His will be done in earth as it is in heaven. All nations will be blessed by Him. That will never happen without Jesus Christ. We see it. We see it now. Is all <laughs> nations getting along? Absolutely not. It's far from that. I still don't see how we're going to get that to happen. It will be impossible. That world peace could happen. It, it, there is no... Without Jesus, the Prince of Peace, the King of Peace, we cannot have any kind of unity, any kind of... You know, and they do. They hold hands and they sing Kumbaya and they get close. But it's, it's a sliver. It is a sliver of the world's population at best when that happens. Now, Zechariah has a whole picture in Zechariah's prophecy where all the world will come together and who do they make war with? Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That makes sense. Because we see it happening now. We see how they hate, how they've hated for centuries, Christians. They're still being persecuted. In fact, we need to lift up our brothers and sisters in places uh, in that where it is totally uh, not just frowned on. People, they're putting their lives in jeopardy in proclaiming Jesus Christ. And putting their faith, putting their trust, putting everything in Jesus Christ. And they have nothing. There's nothing else for them to put their trust in or their faith. I envy that kind of faith. I envy them in a way. I really do. We get so complacent. We get so comfortable in our little world here where I have to wonder, am I trusting in him with everything? Blessings from Him. Blessings from the King. And finally, I'm going to wrap it up with, we are not blessed in the way that we could be because we like sin. We are not blessed in the way that we could be because we're so comfortable, happy, dare I say, content, in our sin. We are. We get to this place where, you know, I'll just kind of stay here in this zone where I don't get messed with. And we don't say it out loud, but we're, we're not growing anymore. We're not being challenged. We're just kind of set in our ways and set in our place. And this is where I am. This is where I'll always be. <laughs> and there's and nothing going to change that. And God says, no, I've got blessings. I'm the righteous king. I want to bless you, shower you with blessings. And we say, no, but I like this junk. I know it's killing me. I like this, this mess, this vomit that I'm eating. I like it. I know it's not good for me. And the Lord, you know, is so patient. He's so good. But he's righteous. He's the righteous king. And he's coming soon. Amen? Amen. He's coming soon. And I, I really hope that it's sooner. <laughs> Not uh, that we don't have to you know, put up with this world 
too much longer. But let that be, let that be a, a blessing. When the Lord comes, the whole earth is going to be filled with joy, with glory. When He is on the throne, reigning as King Supreme, as it's always meant to be, there will be no regrets. There will be no second guessing. In fact, we will all say what? Righteous and true are his judgments. Righteous and true are your ways. You are God. And no man is. He's the only wise king. The only God. Let our praise um, continually be of him. He does wonder, wondrous works, right? His ways are so beyond our ways. Amen and amen. You know, let it be so. That's what amen literally is translated. Let it be the way that this is stating it will be. And what did it just say in verse 19, Psalm 72? The earth be filled with his glory. Let it be that way, Lord. Even now. <laughs> Let it be that way. It's not just us awaiting His return. It's not just us looking and groaning, but all of creation, amen, is groaning. They're wanting things to be set right again. Because do you know it? They're not right now. <laughs> They're far from it. There's so much pain, so much perversion, injustice, you know, things that happen that people get away with. Aren't you glad that my trust is in Him? Some trust in horses, the psalmist write. Some trust in chariots, but we trust in the name of the Lord. We would say today, some trust in tanks. Some trust in the U.S. Army. Some trust in Ferraris. Some trust in whatever. You fill in the blank. That's what our modern day vernacular would translate that to be. But I will trust in the name of the Lord because the name of the Lord is a strong tower. <coughs> You're not going to be let down. You're not going to be disappointed. Amen. It's forever. It's forever. His name endures forever. Amen. Well, Lord, we thank You for Your Word this evening, God. Help us to put our trust fully in You. Lord, that we would believe that what You say is true, that what You have stated in Your Word will come to pass. Lord, that just as You came at Your first coming, as the suffering servant, as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, you are coming again. And in your second coming, you are a conquering king, the lion of the tribe of Judah that will make and set everything right. Thank you for the promise of the righteous king. We just want to continue that our lips would speak of your goodness of your righteousness of your mercies just your loving kindness and lord your goodness and grace and just amazing lord all that you do keep us from being selfish keep us from being prideful arrogant speaking about ourselves lifting up ourselves Lifting up man. Praising man. Keep us from being those that get our eyes off of you. Lord, help us to keep our eyes on you. Knowing you're coming. You're coming soon. And we just want to be watching and waiting. Eagerly, earnestly, fervently. Desiring your return above all others, Lord. Help us, Lord, we pray.